Hello, thanks for tuning in to the fourth installment of the Grow Native webinar series. My name is Felicia. I'm the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. Today, we're going to be hearing from Jared Hubner, MPF's Director of Prairie Management on how to establish a prairie planting. MPF's Director of Prairie Management, Jared Hubner, oversees prairie management planning and execution, including invasive species control, prescribed fire, and all other aspects of the stewardship of MPF's prairies. Hubner also administers prairie stewardship grants and participates in prairie outreach and education activities. He earned a Bachelor of Science in Fisheries and Wildlife Sciences from the University of Missouri Columbia in 2010. While in college, Hubner worked at MPFs and the Missouri Department of Conservation's Prairie Fort Conservation and Expansion Areas in Callaway County on a variety of prairie reconstruction activities. After graduating, Hubner worked as a wildlife biologist at the August A. Bush Memorial Conservation Area in St. Charles. He holds a level three fire burn boss certification and has conducted numerous wildlife population surveys. Jared was just recently named Wildlife Conservationist of the Year by the Conservation Federation of Missouri on March 6th, 2020. Jared, his wife, and his two kids live in the Joplin, Missouri area, his home base for carrying out prairie management for MPF. Thank you very much to everyone for attending our Grow Native webinars this month. It's been a great way to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Grow Native program. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Jared. Thank you, Felicia. Um, thanks everybody for attending this. Uh, it's a little bit weird for me because I'm used to looking at everybody sitting in some sort of an auditorium or larger room and I can interact with everybody, but uh, we'll do the best we can here. Hope everybody's doing well. So, um, and Carol said, we'll do, uh, we'll do some questions at the end. So everyone kind of knows how they're doing that. Um, this here, the slide here that you can see is a, a prairie reconstruction. It's approximately 10 years old. Uh, on a private piece of property where we store our equipment. Um, so most of these slides that you will see are uh, different uh, versions of prairie plantings. So just a little bit about the Missouri Prairie Foundation. Uh, our mission is to protect and restore remaining prairie and other native grassland communities through acquisition, management, education, and research. Um, and then we also have the Grow Native program at, that uh, we, we house and I think have for over 15 years now and also run the Missouri Invasive Plant Task Force. This slide here, you can see the, the two different slides. Um, at the time of statehood, we had approximately 15 million acres of prairie. Um, so we have fewer than 60,000 scattered acres right now. And, and of that 60,000, much of that is, is highly degraded or fragmented with tree lines or uh, crop fields, things like that. So it's very isolated, small scattered pieces uh, and of much less quality than what it would have been uh, historically. And if you can see on the, the map on the left of your screen there, the, the red and the tan colors. Um, it, just to put that in perspective, in the tan, largely in the tan area, we currently have around 15 million acres of trees in the state. So if you're driving through the Ozarks, driving through most of Missouri, you see all the trees. Just think of all those trees as prairie. And uh, for me, that just helps, I guess, bring that to reality. I, you know, I'm around and I see little prairies here and there all around uh, the southwest part of the state. But when you think of all the trees in the state being prairie, uh, it kind of really brings that to life. So what is prairie? Um, you know, talking with landowners and other uh, wildlife professionals, Everyone has a little bit different um, definition of what, what they view as being prairie, uh, but the definition is a native grassland ecosystem dominated by perennial warm season grasses, broadleaf plants, uh, which are all your wildflowers, sedges, and then scattered shrubs. Uh, and we say scattered shrubs, um, you know, everyone kind of has a different idea of how many shrubs should be out there, but uh, not large expansive acres and acres of shrubs um, in a continuous uh, swath. A uh, few scattered trees, primarily in riparian corridors, lower areas that get more water. Trees obviously need more water, so they're going to be in those areas um, closer to where the larger streams are um, and prairie swales. In this part of the prairie region, uh, especially the southwest and western portions of the state, 
uh, prairie evolved chiefly with fire and drought, um, not quite as much with great large grazing animals like the uh, short grass and um, other prairies in the western part of the U.S. evolved. And that last that last picture that that is a remnant prairie, just kind of showing everybody what you know to expect of a remnant prairie. So there are different, I guess, um, versions of what you could consider a native grassland community. Um, the first photo up top shows our uh, Carver woodland. Um, it's almost more of a forest at this point. Um, we're opening it up to, into a woodland. Uh, it was logged at some point in the past, and so you can see the smaller tree diameters um, and then a lot of undergrowth. Uh, we're gonna try to open that up mainly with fire, maybe a little bit of thinning. Uh, to the right of that, you can see an open woodland, um, and that's what I would, you know, characteristic of a woodland is mature, um, scattered oak trees, hickory trees, uh, woodland tree species with a lot of herbaceous undergrowth, um, not just, you know, a solid leaf, leaf litter underneath. And then in the bottom corner, you can see uh, what a savanna would look like. Very, very scattered trees, maybe one per acre or less. Uh, usually transitioning from uh, a more densely stocked woodland, kind of on the very fringe of open prairie. Um, and that's also at our Carver site. It's, a, it's where the planting field transitions to the open prairie. Um, and then obviously open prairie, everyone kind of has a picture in their mind of what open prairie looks like. Um, what is a reconstruction? This is another term that uh, kind of gets confused or misused from time to time. Uh, restorations versus reconstructions. Um, so a reconstruction is basically you're having to start over. If you're reconstructing something, uh, you're starting over from scratch. Um, and we use our remnants uh, or intact ecosystems as a guide for that. Um, so, you know, if there's a remnant nearby, you can kind of look at those plants and, and see this is what this site should look like or would have looked like historically. Um, and then restorations, basically implies that there's uh, native plants there or some sort of native component that is worth saving uh, and restoring back to its original remnant condition. So just kind of an overview of the slides we'll go into into more depth. Um, site history and preparation, uh, this can really help inform a lot of your uh, decisions along the way. Fighting invasives, uh, it's a critical step to, to this whole um, reconstructions or prairie plantings. Seed sourcing and selection, uh, there's some important considerations there. Uh, planting, different methods and timing. Follow-up maintenance, which is critical to long-term success, and then uh, long-term management uh, once you've got a successful planting. So this is an overview of our Carver Prairie. Um, the darker green inside the yellow boundary line, that's remnant prairie. You can see the lighter green uh, color and that was a crop field at one time. When we purchased this prairie, it was in fescue and non-native legumes, uh, other invasive species in there as well. There was an old home site back there. So other issues that had to be dealt with. Um, but we, when we purchase a piece of property, we wanna kind of identify the historical conditions uh, and vegetation. And so uh, we can consort various government databases. Uh, the government land office notes are helpful for us. Uh, historical surveys, various things, and then also local knowledge can be helpful. Um, that red line that you see crossing the map there was kind of the historic woodland boundary. So everything kind of to the south and west of that line would have been historic woodland. Um, and then right around either side of that line would have been kind of your transition line like we covered um, where it would be more kind of savanna probably. And then the further you get away from that line up, you know, under the high ridges um, to the north is gonna be a lot more open dry prairie. Um, so we can kind of use that to identify what we wanna do on this piece of property here. Um, and, and folks can use similar notes and historical accounts on their own properties um, to, to help you kind of inform what you want to, to uh, make your property look like. And sometimes you don't care what it was historically. Sometimes you just want a, a pretty pollinator planting and that's great too. Um, 
So some of the preparation that you'll need to go through, removing the unwanted vegetation. Um, and I always stress that this is a multiple year thing. It's not, it's not just fall and then following spring and then you, you drill in the spring and you've got a prairie planting. Um, especially when you have a sod like fescue, uh, you really don't know what that thick grass is hiding. Um, so killing the fescue out is basically year one, a fall and a spring type treatment. And then you need to wait a year to two years really to see what you're going to have to deal with after that. Uh, because I would say at least 75% of the time, um, you've got other things that are problematic that you need to be dealing with uh, for one to two years after that before you really uh, want to plant that expensive seed on those acres. Um, so treating invasive species also is another multiple year task in a lot of cases. Uh, like I said, if, you, if you're dealing with a sod type situation, if you're dealing with a crop field, those weeds really don't have a huge seed bank built up and so you can uh, do a lot less prep and plant sooner. Um, the reconstruction area where you are planning to plant your seeds really should be bare ground or deadened prior to planting. So uh, those seeds need seed to soil contact. They're not going to uh, germinate and get in the soil if there's a layer of thatch. So removing that layer of thatch, uh, getting soil contact with those seeds is critical to the success of those seeds and their germination. And then, so at the bottom, I've kind of got three treatments or cropped, and this is basically at a minimum, you need kind of a fall, spring, fall type um, herbicide treatment. So, you know, fall and spring is going to deal with your fescue. And then a, the following fall, summer or fall, uh, we'll deal with some of those other invasives, whether it's Cerecia lespidiza or invasive thistles that come up. Uh, or if you're dealing with a crop field, a lot of times uh, you can plant right after you're harvesting beans. So you're ha you'll harvest the beans in the fall and you can go in and plant that winter because uh, you know, it's got a history of cropping. The crops obviously are the main seed that's in there. Those are removed. And so you're left with kind of a clean slate after that crop is removed. This uh, slide here shows the first year that we're working at our uh, Noah Browns Prairie in Southwest Missouri. And this was another fescue pasture, a lot of non-native legumes, um, non-native thistles, just a lot of stuff you don't want. Um, so this is a fall treatment with glyphosate and Roundup. And so we went in, sprayed this site. Uh, there was a lot of taller hedge trees and locust trees through here that we mowed first. And then, so we're able to spray a much smaller version of that tree um, with repeated herbicide treatments. Um, right now it's actually planted to sunflowers. Um, so it's been sprayed with glyphosate twice. It's planted to sunflowers and we're gonna host a, a youth dove hunt there. And um, so I'll be monitoring it all summer long for things like Cerecia lespidiza, uh, any other invasives that may pop up. I'll be spot treating tree sprouts. Um, so we really just want to kind of, without tilling that, um, because it is right next door to our remnant, we're not sure if it's ever been tilled. Uh, and also by tilling, you can sometimes expose more weed seeds. Uh, and so you're kind of working against yourself uh, in some cases. Um, so we're just going to, we're no-tilling those sunflowers and then treating things as they pop up for anywhere from, you know, two to five years, just depending on what we see um, in the next couple of years. Just some alternative methods. Um, you can see this tarp here kind of in a little uh, patch of sod. Uh, looks like mostly fescue, some clover there. Uh, solarization with tarps can be very effective, especially for small sites. Uh, or sites that maybe there's some sort of organic component or things like that near schools, whatever the case may be, uh, where you don't want to or can't use herbicides. Um, and like I, I want to stress that this is not really an option on a 10 acre planting or even a few acres would be really hard to do this on. Uh, but basically put these tarps down in the summer months and um, I think you can put, uh, you know, put mulch or something on top of there as well, and it helps heat that up even more. But basically, it cooks the seed bank, uh, and so it kills all that vegetation out. You leave it for several weeks, you pull that off, and then you're kind of left with essentially a clean slate in that little area. Um, there's not a lot of good other methods besides herbicide and solarization, and um, other than tilling, you know. Um, 
So those are kind of your options for, for prepping an area. So just to go through some of these herbicides here, um, these are the main ones that we use. There's some in here that we don't really use, but uh, they do have good valid uses. And then uh, there's a couple on here that we don't use. So I'll kind of go through these real quick uh, and then folks can ask questions at the end. Uh, Remedy and Pasture Guard, those are both triclopyr based chemicals. Those are great for spraying a broad range of broadleaf plants. So uh, Cerecia lespidiza, invasive thistles, um, honeysuckle during the growing season, um, pretty much any broadleaf type of plant, those work really well for. Um, so we, we typically use Remedy. Uh, we use Pasture Guard on more of our degraded sites because it has that fluoroxapyr, which is a little bit more uh, soil residual. So we'll use it on a more degraded area, hoping to kill some of those seedlings uh, if they're to germinate soon after treatment. Garlon is the same basically as the, the two above that. Um, it's labeled for forestry uses. So if you're working in a wooded area, it's got a label that kind of allows for use around mature trees and things like that. Um, milestone is a, a newer chemical. It's uh, supposed to be fairly selective, especially in forestry applications. It, um, there's certain families of plants that it doesn't harm. Uh, in a prairie type setting, it kills most broadleafs and it's really, really effective on legumes. So like locust sprouts, uh, any type of clover, uh, any types of vetch, um, trefoil, if there's any of those invasives, it works really well in invasive thistles. Uh, so it's really, really effective and also has a residual component to it. Uh, so it can be really effective for preparation. Um, Outrider is what we use on Johnson grass. It's pretty much the go-to chemical um, or versions of it. That sulfur sulfuron active ingredient ingredient is what you want on Johnson grass. Uh, Plateau is really effective when starting a, a planting, um, especially when you don't have any forbs in it. So if you're doing a, a planting for a grazing mix or you just want uh, a, mix, a mixed grass planting, uh, it is really good as a pre-emergent and it kills fescue as well and it kills Johnson grass. So um, it can work well in that case. We use select uh, volunteer clethodum based chemicals um, when spraying fescue, uh, especially during the growing season. And what is, it's a grass selective chemical. It um, really doesn't harm mature warm season grasses. So uh, it'll just kill the grasses and then if you happen to get it on mature warm season grasses, it really doesn't kill them just because they're such deep rooted plants. Um, so it works great on things like cheat and fescue, uh, even things like brome if you're wanting to spray those amongst other uh, grasses. Rodeo round is just a water safe roundup. Uh, and those bottom three, crossbow, uh, you can use a little bit on winter creeper. Um, Typically chemicals with 2,4-D aren't the best to be using just because they do have some environmental hazards. Uh, those last two items on there, we absolutely don't use any of those on our prairies. They're very soil residual. They can run with uh, surface water. Um, so there's a lot of, I guess, um, a lot of harm that can be done if you're not following the label to the T or things don't, you know, that it rains when it wasn't, they weren't calling for rain or things like that. Um, and then uh, surfactants are really important uh, to follow these labels. All of these uh, chemicals are going to call for a surfactant of some sort. Uh, the select and volunteer, those grass selective herbicides, those typically call for a crop oil, which is different than a surfactant. Um, and then in some instances, if you're using like well water with uh, glyphosate, uh, if you have, um, I think it is maybe really high calcium in your, your well water, you want to use an ammonium sulfate to counteract that. Um, so you really want to follow this chemical labels. It's going to spell all of this out for you, uh, or you can find somebody that can read those for you uh, before doing any type of application. Um, and then I do want to kind of point out because a lot of times pesticides get lumped in with herbicides. Uh, you know, even going to like a pesticide applicators class, for certification, they're gonna refer to everything as a pesticide. Herbicides are kind of lumped in with that. We don't use any pesticides. Pesticides to me, they kill insects, pollinators. That's what we're growing these prairies for. So we're not out there trying to kill pests. We use herbicides. 
uh, strictly for control of invasive species. Um, and so there's a huge difference in those two words and they really shouldn't be used uh, one and the same. And then just rates and reading chemical labels. These, these chemicals are anymore, they're very precise, uh, too much and you can kill pretty much a whole field, you know, and not enough, it's not gonna do anything. So you really need to read those labels and stick to them. Uh, just some other considerations. This is our Pleasant Run Creek uh, reconstruction site. This field here is about 67 acres. And when we purchased it, there was a, uh, it was a, a really eroded pond dam. It wasn't constructed well. It had really big soil berms and giant rocks sticking out. Um, this field had been grazed. So the, you know, the banks were really steep and eroded and that's not good for herps because they can't basically get in and out of the water. Um, and so we took and had those berms dozed down. This was before we did any, any planting. Uh, we dozed those back out, smoothed it out, and essentially filled it in to where it wasn't a deep pond. It wouldn't hold fish. And now it's really good for shorebirds and different types of herps, uh, different types of crayfish, things like that that belong on the prairie. Fish don't really, like bluegill and bass, don't really belong on the prairie. So um, this functions much more as a uh, kind of an upland wetland uh, type system. And we see shorebirds and waterfowl using it in the fall, especially. So there, there's other considerations besides just throwing seed down and growing natives on a site, whether it's cleanup of debris, old tires, things like that. We kind of had all of that on this site. Um, but those, those all need to be kind of considered and addressed before you spend the time and money and effort, um, you know, planting that seed and, and working towards the end result. So just kind of to cover invasive species a little bit more, um, you really wanna take the proper steps to eradicate all, any and all invasives prior to planting. Uh, if you don't do that, you're, you're really fighting against yourself because it's really hard to spray a plant that you don't want and not also spray plants that you want that are right next to it. So um, basically, you know, you spend all this money on seed and then you have a bunch of Cerecia lespedeza come up. And so you have to go through and spray this big patch of Cerecia. Well, the chemicals aren't selective enough to just kill that Cerecia or just kill that thistle. And so unless you're cutting each plant and treating the stem of each plant, which is not feasible, um, you're also killing those plants you just seeded. So uh, you really wanna do as best you can to kill as most of those things out before planting. Um, and it really saves a lot of headaches down the road. And then just to cover again, I, I really want to stress that the invasives may not be visible initially, especially if you're dealing with uh, a sod like fescue. So if you've sprayed out and killed your fescue, um, you really want to give it at least a year to two years after that fescue is gone to see what comes up. Um, in this case, we had fescue back here. We had non-native legumes, uh, other lespedezas and really didn't see a lot of Cerecia. And now three years in, we see a lot of Cerecia popping up. Um, so it's just one of those things where, um, you know, we, we kind of had a timeline and funding for a project and, and really could have benefited from waiting probably a couple more years uh, to see what was gonna come up. Um, Johnson grass is another one that can be a headache. Um, sweet clover can certainly cause issues, especially it seems like up north, uh, various vetches, Japanese honeysuckle, um, Japanese honeysuckle is more of an issue where you have things for it to climb on like brushy draws and fence rows but um, so here's a slide you can see this is a planting um, and various years can be a lot worse so you know the last couple of years have been wet it seems like it's been a really good year for thistles uh, this year there was a ton of ladino clover everywhere it seemed like um, so you see these invasive thistles here and you can tell most invasive thistles are going to have kind of a greenish upper leaf and a greenish lower leaf surface. Uh, most of the natives, especially in the upland uh, systems in Missouri, um, they're going to have a bright white underside to the leaf, the natives will. So uh, you can easily distinguish those. The other thing that kind of gives the non-natives away is most of the time they're blooming now or earlier, uh, whereas a lot of the natives don't bloom until late July into August. So um, that's not always the case, but um, if you see a, a thistle blooming right now, most, most likely it's a non-native. So um, 
but yeah, you can see we treated those and we treat them with dye just to reduce over application of chemical. Um, it helps us just keep track of where we've been on a hillside. If it's just me and a volunteer, it's easy to get mixed up and retreat things that just got sprayed. So the dye helps kind of keep track of your location on that hillside. Um, but this is another one where we, we kind of killed some brome grass out. Uh, we really hadn't seen hardly any thistles or some kind of around the neighborhood there, but um, two years goes by, we had last year's really rainy weather and all of a sudden we had hundreds of thistles on this hillside. Um, so, you know, it just, if you have the luxury of being able to kind of draw out your preparation time, I would definitely recommend doing that. Here's some Cerecia lespedeza. Uh, this is actually in a remnant site, but just to show you kind of using that blue dye. Um, if I'm out there walking around with a backpack sprayer or even on an ATV, it really helps me know where I've been. So I'm not wasting my time spraying half the plants out there twice. And then you're spraying twice as much chemical, uh, potentially killing good wildflowers that you want and things like that. So seed, um, this is this is just a photo of kind of our seed seed collection setup. Um, I'll collect the seed in the fall, especially with our uh, kind of a flail vac, kind of a big vacuum type thing and run it through that hammer mill. Um, but just a few considerations for folks when, when purchasing seed or acquiring seed for their plantings, um, it, it really pays to kind of look at your site history um, going back to those either government notes, county records, things like that, um, and just your on-site conditions, whether you're on a dry site or a, you know, a bottomland site, uh, whether it's really rocky and droughty, things like that, those really need to help you inform what plants to buy. Um, there are certain plants that aren't going to grow in wet conditions, so um, trying to think of just a couple off the top of the head, head but anyways, you need to, you need to get sites or seeds that are suited for your site. So, you know, dry and rocky type seeds need to go on dry and rocky areas, not wet prairies. Um, so really pay attention to your conditions uh, and pay attention to them throughout the growing season as well. So um, some sites are, you know, um, only wet in the spring and then the rest of the year they're very droughty, things like that. You need to pay attention to those uh, when, when looking at a seed mix. Um, diversity is another thing I always try to stress. Um, you, you really want to try to get the most diverse seed mix that you can. Um, this is really going to help when you're trying to attract pollinators, trying to attract wildlife. Um, there's several species of pollinators that only are um, served by one species of plant, so you're not going to have uh, certain pollinators without that individual plant. Um, you just, you stand a chance of doing the most good with a diverse seed mix. And then you also stand a chance of having the best success because you're obviously scattering more species out across there. Uh, a lot of these species have relationships with each other uh, under the soil that we really don't understand very well. And so uh, diversity is, is really important. Um, it also does make your seed mix get more expensive, but just a consideration. Um, and then sourcing, local is always considered best. Um, stay as local as you can, you know, most, uh, most plantings, you know, require you to do, uh, Missouri local seed if you're getting cost share, things like that. Um, but we try to stay within a couple of counties, um, sometimes maybe up to a hundred or so miles away, but, uh, but usually within a couple of counties of, of our prairies, we can find a lot of local seed collected by seed vendors throughout the state. So, um, that's kind of, kind of what we use as our guide. Um, planting and methods. Uh, timing is really important. So a lot of these wildflower seeds, especially, uh, especially the hard coated seeds, they need to be scarified. And so uh, the best way to do that is to seed them in the winter months, like December, January, into February, um, and let mother nature do the scarification for you. So that freeze thaw cycle helps break that seed coat and it also helps get those seeds uh, in good soil contact. Um, if you're, if you're out broadcasting seed in May, you're not going to get very good results. Um, there's no freeze thaw cycle to pull the seed into the soil and then there's no scarification going on. So, um, so timing is pretty critical when planting, uh, various methods. This can also, uh, decide on when you plant. So as I mentioned, broadcasting really needs to be done in the winter time. 
Um, if you're drilling the seed, which isn't my favorite method, but if you're drilling the seed, you can go into, you know, April and May. Um, if you're just drilling grass, you can go all the way through about the end of June, honestly, for warm season grasses only. Uh, and they seem to do really well, um, especially if you can limit the competition uh, with like Plateau, that herbicide I had mentioned. Uh, just for grasses, they can be planted and drilled much later. The reason I don't like the drilling for wildflowers and diverse plantings is because you've got all those seeds in a mix and each seed needs to be placed at a different depth in the soil. And so those are going to, those are going to all be drilled at the same depth when you're drilling. So, you know, a, a really small seeded legume might need to be in the top um, quarter inch or less of soil and then the grass needs to be around a half inch deep. And so it's really hard to determine that in a, or control that in a drill. Uh, and also drills are a little bit hard to set, um, especially for the average landowner. Depth is hard to set and then also um, the rate at which the drill is seeding is hard to set uh, because you've got such a an odd seed mix from what the manufacturers are used to you planting through them. So uh, it's not a consistent one species mix. And so it just, it's really hard to control. What I, what I do if I'm drilling is I take the feed tubes off and just let the drill, uh, the drill will meter the seed and then it just drops on top of the ground. So it's not feeding it down into the ground at various depths. Um, and then, like I said, obviously broadcasting is best. This is a, a Vicon style seeder we had borrowed from Fish and Wildlife Service. There's a a couple, I think, throughout the state that landowners can borrow. Um, they're housed at MDC offices usually. Um, but yeah, it's a good way to do it. Another way to broadcast the seed that works really well and it's really precise is to go to a local farmer's co-op, uh, take your seed in, let them know you have how, however many acres you have, mix it in with an appropriate amount of like potash or lime and have them set that cart for your acreage and then drive over your acreage. Um, those carts are really precise uh, and usually I'll set the cart at half the rate so I can go over the acreage twice. Uh, my biggest fear is spending $10,000 plus dollars on seed and only planting half of the intended acreage. So um, I know landowners can uh, sympathize with that and you want to cover the acreage that you want to cover and be as precise as you can. So setting that um, the setting the card at half the rate or even these broadcast seeders setting them at a much lesser rate than what you think you need to uh, kind of run it in a checkerboard one way and then cross it the other way is really thorough. Um, you kind of fill in any gaps that you left going the other way. So um, it's just a good method to make your make sure you're covering all your intended acreage. Um, and then stressing bare ground. Um, you can see this site right here. Even after a burn, there's a lot of thatch. So um, you know, over the winter months, that burn material is going to melt down and kind of rot away. Uh, but you really don't want any more thatch than what you see in that background right there, uh, or it's really going to inhibit that seed soil contact, like I mentioned. So this is a, a picture of our planting site at Snowball Hill this winter. Um, these are ideal planting conditions. It's cold. Uh, that snow as it melts will kind of suck that seed down into the ground. Um, the birds do have fun eating some of your seed in the meantime, but um, it's, you can really see where you've been so you can keep track of your kind of grid that you're driving. Uh, it just makes for really good planting conditions. Um, you can see last year's planting in the background there. And those bags, you know, some of that seed we collected, some we purchased. You see a rake there and a tarp. We're mixing that seed before we put it in this broadcast seeder here. Um, and then, like I said, just drive your grid and broadcast that seed. There's the drill uh, that I mentioned. Um, it, it's, it's not as quick as broadcasting. And to me, I, there's just some variables that can cause some issues uh, where I like broadcasting it a lot better. Uh, just one th quick thing on diversifying your planting. So some species can be really expensive to buy, like uh, say Indian paintbrush or lead plant seed can be high. Um, and some things really don't establish very well from seed either. So uh, one thing we've done to try to diversify plantings um, is to purchase plugs from uh, local greenhouses around the state. Um, and we actually sent off our own hand collected seed, but they, they have their own uh, 
local seed as well that they propagate plugs from. But we, we buy these plugs and they're generally already a year old. And basically we're adding diversity and we're adding it quicker than what the seed would do on its own. So uh, especially things that don't produce a lot of seed or they're highly conservative or rare on our prairies, we'll collect a little bit of seed we can and try to have plants grown and then go out and plant those uh, either in the spring or the fall uh, can work. And you're just adding that diversity. It's cheaper than buying a lot of seed of those plants. Um, and a lot of times, like I said, it, it establishes those plants really quickly. So you, you see a, a benefit from them quicker. Maintenance, uh, mowing two times in the first year as a general recommendation. Anytime the planting gets 18 or so inches tall, you wanna mow it back to about eight inches tall. Um, that's at least twice in the first year and once in the second year. Um, generally by this time of year and that second year, even if it is getting tall, those plants have enough roots established they can compete. Um, monitoring invasives and then burning as soon as you can. And I've got burn often there. Uh, sometimes you can't burn until the third or fourth year just because there's not enough grass established. Uh, oftentimes you'll get a lot of foxtail that'll carry a fire first year. Uh, and it's good to burn that off so you don't have that big thatchy layer that following growing season on those new uh, wildflowers. But, um, and that's why I've got burn as soon as you can and burn off. And um, it just creates the best growing conditions for young plants. Um, and then fire off and stimulates some of those forbs the following spring, so. Here is just a photo of a, a planting mowing. So um, you can see it's, you know, approximately 18 inches to two feet tall, mowing it back uh, about as high as I can with that brush hog there. It's pretty simple. Um, just get over those acres and mow them a couple of times and reduce that competition for those young, uh, young plants that don't have really deep roots established yet. Long-term management uh, is really crucial. Uh, you can see a photo of backpack spraying and burning. Uh, that's kind of the two biggest things that I do this time of year is or uh, in my job is uh, treating invasives throughout the growing season and burning in the winter time. Um, so that's really what these plantings need to, to be long-term. So just one note on burning. Uh, I think burning is best. Um, you really don't want to burn more than half the area. Even if, even if you think about a small area in town or even your backyard, you've got native pollinators, you've got all kinds of things that overwinter in that vegetation, whether it's in the stems or in the litter. Uh, and, and that's why we're planting these plants is for the benefit of wildlife. Um, if you're burning at all, you're basically killing all that, all that is overwintering in that. So um, we try to keep it less than half of the area, even on big prairies. Um, and that allows, those kind of uh, pollinators, insects to recolonize uh, the freshly burned units from adjacent unburned units. So um, even on this, like, like I said, even on a really small piece in your backyard or uh, a flower garden in town, things like that, um, leave, some, leave some standing vegetation through the winter months. Um, you can cut it out and remove it uh, come spring, but leave it through the winter months until those things emerge um, just to you know, give those uh, animals a better shot. Um, at long-term survival. So real quick, going through some of our plantings, what to expect. Um, lots of weeds, lots of bare ground usually. Um, you'll see this fleabane, the white flower. You'll see lots of um, black-eyed Susans. You'll see lots of ragweed. Um, but bare ground is good. If you can stand over top of it and see the sun hitting the ground at midday, um, you know those little little bitty forbs that you really can't even see or identify yet, you know they're getting sunlight. Um, so that's good. If you see lots of shade and then, you know, six inch tall grass shading out everything under it, um, you know you've got some issues you need to deal with, whether it's mowing or um, you've got some invasive cool season grasses or, or what, but um, that's, that's a typical planting right there first year. So this is the year two planting. You can't see much different other than, this is likely from a plug. Um, you can see a milkweed species has flowered right there and has pods on it. So uh, that's year two in a planting. You can still see bare ground there. There's lots of fleabane, lots of black eyed Susan. Uh, there's ragweed in there. I'm not sure. That, there's sedges in there. I'm not sure if you can see them in this photo, but um, it's going to look very similar. Um, so you kind of just have to know that that is what your planting is going to be the first two to 
two to four years probably. Here is a year one planting at Snowball, um, Snowball Hill up in Cass County. And this one's a little different. So this one was, we're planting into a crop field, whereas Carver, we had a, a sod to deal with. So there's a lot less competition here and you see results sooner. Um, so you see those, those forbs, you see plants flowering much sooner than you would when they have to deal with existing sod and untilled soil. Um, so year two, we've got tall flowering cone flowers. Um, you can see gamma grass has flowered there uh, close by. There's a lot of other photos or a lot of other plants nearby of flowering forbs just in year two. So, um, and you can see how much the competition is reduced. So they'd sprayed, you know, Roundup and pre-emergence and things like that on these crop fields um, for probably decades before we purchased it. And so there's not a huge competition uh, seed bank built up. Uh, but yeah, this is year two. You see all the ragweed, it's kind of the understory and it's really thick, but then you see all of the forbs and things coming up through it. There's compass plant, marsh milkweed, common milkweed, a clump of looks like big blue stem there. Um, but that's not what you're always going to have. The, the ragweed fades out. It's a native plant. Uh, it's to be expected year one, year two, year three. Uh, and slowly it will lessen as the natives uh, become more dominant, start shading it out, things like that. Um, but don't be alarmed when you see things like uh, ragweed. It's way better than having, uh, you know, like I said, a fescue understory or something like that. It's not going to be nearly as competitive. And that's another reason we do the mowing too. Uh, it limits seed production on some of those uh, plants that we really don't want to be there. Uh, and it also, you know, uh, creates more sunlight. So this is a year three planting, uh, an overhead shot. You still see the greatly reduced uh, ragweed down low. Uh, you see the sawtooth sunflower, the ashy sunflower. It looks like there's Menarda on the far left. Um, I think that's mare's tail also on the far left. So it's another cropland type weed uh, and it'll go away over time. Um, but that that's, you know, to me, that's looking good right there. You've got forbs that are two, three foot tall and they're that tall before the ragweed jumps up. So uh, they're going to be very competitive in year three. And really this year, they ought to burn. Um, you know, there's not a lot of grass in this photo, but I just, just knowing that field, there's enough, there's enough fuel there to carry a fire. So it'll really look nice that following year after a burn. Another shot there of year three, you can see all the warm season grasses kind of in that understory. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's to me already a, a pretty big success from a crop field to that in three years. Uh, just a shot at our Pleasant Run Creek reconstruction. You can see the yellow flowers painted with blue dye and herbicide. That was bird's foot trefoil. Um, this is year one. So you see just a carpet of ragweed. You see some warm season grasses poking through, uh, some things like ironweed, some of your early species. Um, but that's what they're going to look like. So uh, that's what we expect. Jumping to year three, a couple different shots here across that same area. Um, so if you look up, you see the asterisk in the top right corner, uh, you'll see that kind of unique looking tree. Um, and then I'll go to this next one. You see the asterisk down there in the left side. That's kind of just to show you in reference, show you we're looking across the same field here. Um, but you know, you can see all the wildflowers, you can see really thick warm season grass. Um, the right is looking over towards our remnant prairie, which is behind that deadened tree line there. Um, you see all the Menarda. It's really coming along now. And we've got regal fritillaries coming from the nearby remnant uh, and using nectaring on plants in the planting. So that, that right there is, is a huge success. Um, a really conservative butterfly that requires um, undisturbed remnants, high quality remnants with prairie violets. Uh, if we can create habitat next door to these remnants for them, uh, that's a really big success in its own. Real quick, uh, assistance for landowners, cost share programs. Um, your best bet for cost share for a landowner is going to be contacting your local private lands conservationist or PLC. Um, they've got a lot of different programs. Most of their funding is called LAP funding or the landowner assistance program. And it entitles landowners across the state of Missouri to up to $6,000 in a season uh, for various management practices. And then there's also other 
other individual programs on top of that, um, especially when you start looking into some of the federal programs. Uh, so there is quite a bit of assistance out there, uh, especially depending on where you're located in the state. You don't have to do all this on your own. And with that, we'll go to questions. This is just a, uh, this is about four years old now, a planting on a storm shelter in my backyard. So um, just kind of showing you a really small site that can look just like the remnant prairies for the most part. Thanks, Jared. Uh, can you hear me? This is Carol David. I can. Great. Thanks, Jared. That was a great information, lots of information, and we have tons of questions. I will try to kind of organize them by um, sort of site prep and then maintenance, but it might, there's a lot of questions, so I'll, I'll try. Um, so um, there were a few questions or comments, too, about um, Say, say you have sod and, and, and maybe you have a, like a suburban backyard and um, maybe you don't want to use herbicides. Um, I know you showed about using the black plastic with, uh, and then someone else mentioned that clear plastic may work better than black plastic. And there's, he uh, provided a reference from I think, the University of Texas and we'll share that. So tomorrow, Felicia will send an email to all attendees with all um, resources that I, or links that I've shared in chat and then other ones as well. Um, so that was a comment, but also I think there was another question about, can't you just use fire to prep your site? Can't you use fire to kill the sod instead of herbicide? It's Could gonna be really, that? yeah, it's, it's really not gonna work very effectively. I mean, it, if you think about our remnant prairies or uh, any of these hay fields, things like that, that we burn consistently, you can reduce uh, certain plants by burning at certain times of the year, but it's not going to completely eliminate them. And especially something like fescue uh, that kind of spreads above soil and by seed, it's going to be right back. Um, and, and then before you know it, you know, your planting will be looking good and then it's overtaken by fescue again. You really need to do something to kill that plant. Um, and kill every bit of it. Otherwise, if you've got little scattered clumps of it here and there, it's it's just not going to be very effective for you. Um, I know like late late spring burning on fescue is hard on fescue. It's also really hard on all the native wildflowers. So um, even if you thought, well, I could consistently burn in the spring to hurt this fescue uh, and always keep it at bay by doing that, well, you're hurting a lot of your wildflowers burning uh, late in the spring like that too. So burning just is not an effective tool and things like sericea you're not it stimulates sericea especially the seed so um there's just not much you can eliminate with um with fire okay great but of course fire is very important if you if you're in an area where you can burn for maintaining your plantings but as you said the fire isn't going to be killing the um the you know, the underground parts of the plants, but it is very important for, for that maintenance. Correct. Um, there are some questions about, um, you know, understandably, it does seem sort of um, like a, 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 a ironic, maybe that's not the right word, that, you know, you've got to kill all these plants to then create a planting. And, you know, using, whether you use herbicides to kill plants or plastic that's going to basically sort of cook the soil. Um, even if you don't use chemicals, you know, and use the plastic, yes, it does kill soil microbes. And I guess, I guess I, I would say just in, in my experiences, correct, that that is a problem. I mean, it is, it is going to kill soil microbes in a small area, but you have to think about that it, planting a diverse mix is going to give you more diversity over the long term and be supporting other organisms. But maybe you could comment on that a bit, sort of that balance. Yeah, um, yeah. and I agree. It's like, like you said, it's a balance and you kind of have to, you have to kind of run the costs and the benefits of it. So you, you think there's a short term loss of, of this and that and the other, but you think of the long term benefits, especially of doing a, even a, a five acre planting or a 20 acre planting or, or larger, you think of all of the the pollinators, all the wildlife, grassland birds, things like that, that are going to benefit from this. The short-term losses from initial like two years of herbicide use um, and the rates that you're using these herbicides, 
pale in comparison to what the neighbor's using them at every year for their crops. So you, you look at the cost, the short-term costs of you're going to lose the microbes, you're going to lose, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of habitat or whatever for this pollinator, but then down the road, you're going to create all this habitat and you're basically repairing the landscape through this planting. So that's the way I look at it. Um, just something like a, say a fescue treatment. You'll use two quarts to the acre uh, of Roundup for, for fescue. Well, farmers use that three times a season on a corn crop and you're using it once the first fall, once the next spring, and then a lot of times you're done. Um, and so, you know, you're using that twice to prepare your planting, whereas they're using it three times every year for decades. Uh, so, so, I mean, in relation to everything else, you're creating way more good than the harm that you're doing initially. Thanks, Jared. Um, there's also a comment about, you know, some quote weeds, they do have some benefits um, and, you know, having a concern about, you know, removing those weeds. Um, I, one thing that I know you didn't have time to talk about today, but in addition to these native prairie plants providing for pollinating insects, they're also storing tons of carbon in their root systems. And so these long-lived perennial plants have that benefit over a lot of annual weeds. And it's not to say that annual weeds are, it's not, we don't really like to use the words good, bad, um, that they just are what they are. But thinking about, again, like Jared said, the long-term, that there are all of these other benefits to these longer-lived perennials. Um, there were a number of questions about different um, treatment methods for specific plants, and we'll try to, I'll try to get to as many of these questions as I can. I just want to note in the chat, I did provide a chart from Jared um, that's a really handy reference for invasive control methods by plant species. Um, there was a question about um, best herbicide to use for uh, 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 bird's foot trefoil. And you might mention or describe this plant for people who aren't familiar with, with this plant. So actually today, I, I kind of thought it was more of a northern Missouri species. Um, it, it's in North Missouri, it's all along the roadsides right now. It looks, it's a legume type plant, has a yellow flower on it, um, especially like north of I-70. Um, I actually saw some in Jasper County today when we were out doing our Regal Fritillary surveys all along a, a road railroad track. So it grows in deep soils, it grows on rocks evidently along railroad tracks, so uh, that's why it's invasive. The seed is spread oftentimes by mowers, county crews, MoDOT, things like that, so, um, and it's a hard legume type seed, so it lasts in the soil for quite some time. Um, the area we found it was a hay storage area, so another way for things to get moved around was hay was likely purchased from somebody who had seeded it for, uh, you know, getting a legume into their hay crop or happen to get on equipment or whatever, uh, but it was where they had historically um, stored their hay. Um, we sprayed it that first year. I used Milestone, which I mentioned is really hard on legumes. It is a little bit soil residual and we've not seen it come back. So um, hopefully that's a success there. Uh, but Milestone would be one I would recommend. Um, and it's, it's one, like I said, if you spray it while there's good wildflowers that you want to stay there, it's going to kill those too. Um, question about what percent glyphosate should you use for fescue and clover? So um, glyphosate is not very effective on clover. Um, I, I would not use glyphosate if I'm, if I'm trying to kill clover. I would use one of the, the broadleaf selective herbicides, whether it's the Remedy, Pasture Guard, the Milestone works really well on it. Um, it's expensive. Um, but it, it's very effective on those legumes. Roundup will actually, guys nowadays are, are managing food plots for deer and other wildlife of clover with glyphosate. So they'll spray it with like a one quart to the acre rate of Roundup. It kills back most of the other weeds and then the clover is left as the only, only plant in the uh, crop. So uh, just kind of shows you how ineffective glyphosate is on it. But um, Two quarts to the acre is the typical rate for um, for glyphosate, and I know those of you that just have a, a hand sprayer, typically around a 2% rate of glyphosate is what you'd want um, for just fescue. So around three ounces per gallon of water um, in like a backpack sprayer or handheld sprayer is an adequate amount to kill fescue in the growing season. Right now is not a good time for fescue. You want to kill it in the spring or the fall, typically. 
And did you say about the percent? I know you said two quarts to the acre, but I, maybe you don't. Sorry. Yes, 2%. 2%. Okay, exactly. thank yep. you. And what about for cheatgrass? Would you recommend the same thing for cheatgrass as you would for glyphosate? I mean, for uh, fescue, excuse me. Yep, yep. And you can also use uh, that clethodim, select or volunteer are the trade names of that chemical. Uh, that works well in the spring for cheat and fescue. Um, we sprayed some fescue in some of our remnants before the native grasses had really came up. And it's really effective fall and spring. Uh, and you don't harm any of those forbs with that select chemical. So um, either one of those will work well on cheat and fescue. Um, uh, here's a question. Are there concerns about glyphosate getting into deer meat? I guess, I guess she's asking, you know, you know, if, a, if, a, if an animal ingests it, I, I guess I'd say there's a pretty short window of time when it's dying. And then when the plant is dead, I don't think the deer would be eating it. Would you, would you agree, Jared, or how would you? Yeah, and honestly, I mean, th there are a lot of other concerns. I would worry about CWD more than glyphosate getting into deer meat. Um, honestly, I would not worry about it a bit. Um, I don't have any science to back that up, but, but yeah, I, I don't have any concerns with that. Okay, um, Dan, uh, appreciates the class, wonders if we could have multiple sessions. And um, we have had workshops in person and we, we've had something called Prairie School right on our prairies. And uh, I think we would like to do more of those things in the future. Uh, of course, with the current um, public health situation, we turn to the webinars, but do um, check back. We offer lots of educational programming. Um, uh, but moving on to some more questions. Do you have knowledge or experience in installing microbes and fungus into the soil? What types are used for different plants? I've noticed that we have native orchids which require complex ecosystems of fungus for different varieties which grow on, on each other. And um, this is from Carol. Carol, I, I would just say that um, uh, I will post an article about this that we've had in the Missouri Prairie Journal. Um, uh, and one thing that uh, uh, some groups do is it's not actually putting microbes into the soil, but getting microbes into uh, greenhouse situations so that you can add the microbes to plants you're growing in a greenhouse. Um, but Jared may want to mention on that, mention or talk about that as well. Yeah, just briefly, I'm not really well versed in all of the um, soil biology type stuff and the microbes, but I, I just know at least initially Right now, there's really no good way on a large scale to do that. Um, you're also gonna have to get those microbes from somewhere. So if you're getting the conservative microbes from another prairie, you're essentially digging soil from there, moving it to another site. So uh, I think there's a lot of challenges and a lot of things we don't know to really do that on a wide scale right now. Thank you. And I would also say this is a vast new frontier of information. And, and I mean, there's still so much that even, you know, mycologists are, are still learning about. So I think that there will be probably more information in the years to come um, as more groups are uh, really, or, you know, scientists are, are studying this. Um, I'll, I'll try to catch up with some of these questions. There are a number of questions about the best time of year to burn an established planting. Definitely uh, sometime in the fall or winter, dormant season is always best. Um, you don't want to wait till March and April to burn your prairie planting. So uh, I like to typically start in October and run through January. Sometimes we'll push some into February, depending on weather and timing and things like that. Um, but definitely uh, the best plantings I have ever seen were consistently burned in the fall, like in October. So uh, if you can burn in October, November, December, uh, that's definitely ideal on these plantings. Um, there's also a question about how short to mow. Uh, one of our uh, attendees had, I think, was mowing at three inches, and uh, you know, it's a with a with a you know a backyard you know mower, and wondered if that was too short. Uh, I know talking with a couple people, I think, and Murph Wallace could probably um, confirm this, but I had heard that. They had some sites, I think, that may had had established sod grasses or, or lawn type pests, whether it was clover or what. And they basically just kept it mowed short like a lawnmower all summer long and had great results with that. So um, you, you've got to think these plants are 
really putting a lot of root growth on those first couple of years and they're not as long as they can get a little bit of sunlight they're not too concerned about putting on a, a two foot stem and a flower they're they're investing in roots um, so I think that's the biggest thing I typically like to mow around six or eight inches um, tall if I can so okay great thank you and, uh, and there was another question about foxtail controlling foxtail um, because it it also once if you mow it, it 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 just it lays down like a big carpet of hay and it's sort of suffocating plants underneath what would you uh could you comment on that yeah we have had those issues and i know a colleague at mdc has had those issues and uh we kind of i talked to him a couple of years ago we were having an issue in one of our plantings and we both had made the same decision i don't know if it's the right decision we let it grow actually uh, we thought mowing that down, like you mentioned, was basically going to smother everything more than letting it stand. Uh, at least standing, you've got some shadows and some sunlight breaking through. Uh, when you mow all that and lay it over, it's just like you you covered everything with a blanket. So uh, it can be difficult. That might be where you go in with Select, uh, that clethodum-based herbicide. If you see a carpet of foxtail in certain areas, um, you might want to go in with that in, say, late June and and uh, even if you do a light rate, that's not going to completely kill the foxtail, but it stunts it to where it's not going to uh, fully grow and then produce seed. Um, I think it's probably one of those things that needs a little bit more research, but, um, but yeah, foxtail can be a lot more problematic than say ragweed. Okay, thank you. Um, Anita had a question about ashy sunflower in a reconstruction that's taking over. And of course, ashy sunflower is, is a natural part of original prairies and, and in original prairies where those plants have been evolving for thousands of years, they you know, have a lot of competition with each other and kind of help keep their populations in check. But on, on an original prairie, you can go out and see a really large area of just ashy sunflower or some other species. Um, but I, it, 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 it is a concern if you have a small area and you want a lot of diversity. So I guess, Jared, um, both do you have suggestions about controlling ashy sunflower? And then there was another question about species that you've had a lot of good luck with. Maybe there are some species for especially smaller areas that you would recommend not including because of their ag aggressive nature. Um, yeah, on the ashy sunflower, like it is one of those that kind of forms colonies. Um, I don't steer away from it. I, I guess if you were putting it in a seed mix, I would just go on the light end of things. Um, I like it to be in my in my mix. It provides a really nice plant, uh, kind of mid to late summer uh, for pollinators. Um, but yeah, it it can be problematic in plantings where you'll have you know a ten acre planting and two acres is ashy sunflower. Uh, it usually allows some plants to grow in it, whether it's grasses or other occasional forbs, kind of in bare spots. The only thing I could think of maybe um, repeated mowings on it, if you had a thick patch or something like that. I've never, I've never really tried to kill it out. Um, you know, certainly a, a herbicide would kill it, but um, you're going to kill other plants around it too. So I, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, as far as plants to stay away from or to include in small plantings, um, I definitely would not use the tall grasses like Indian grass, uh, big blue stem switchgrass. I wouldn't use those in small areas in town or around your house. Um, they just get really big. They spread quickly. Um, you know, one clump of switchgrass can be two or three foot in diameter and then it spreads and before long that's all you have because um, they're, they're pretty robust plants. They shade things out and they just, they spread a lot quicker than these forbs do. Um, you can see this kind of wildflower mound in the background. Uh, a couple of things that are usually pretty quick to come from seed. Rattlesnake Master does well. That Monarda, that Bee Balm does well. Um, Coreopsises, they tend to uh, spread with seed a lot. So, I mean, if you don't want things escaping on you, uh, a Coreopsis type plant may not be ideal, but they establish easily. They don't really compete with a lot of things. Um, Gray-headed coneflower is another easy one to establish. Uh, prairie blazing star comes up good from seed. A lot of those are taller plants, so you kind of have to, you have to also remember that you're planting these uh, where there's no competition, hopefully. So they're gonna get bigger than what you're used to seeing them in a, a prairie planting where they're competing with 200 other species. So 
uh, if, if in the prairie common milkweed gets four or five foot tall, it's going to get seven feet tall at your house. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind when you're planting some of these things. Thank you. Um, well, question about um, henbit. We have a, around one acre that we are slowly converting to prairie native plantings and we have a lot of henbit and it is so hard to kill. Any suggestions? I, I don't worry about it too much. It kind of seems like it comes up and does its thing before many of these prairie plants do. Um, it's not going to be one where it creates a big thatch from the plants since they're pretty short plants anyways. Uh, some of those early um, weedy type plants or non-native type plants, I really don't worry about them a whole lot. Like I said, most of these prairie wildflowers, especially in a planting, uh, you're not going to have near as many early, early forbs like you do in a remnant prairie. So um, they're not directly competing necessarily with that hen bit. Um, now, if it's to where it's inhibiting seed to soil contact or something like that, you may need to spray it out, but otherwise I, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Okay, thank you. Steve says, Jared, at the end of the year after the grasses and forbs have gone dormant, is it okay to spray the fields with glyphosate to help kill off the cool season grasses slash weeds? I know it is not a problem for the grasses, but what about forbs even after dormancy? So that's, uh, that's one thing that I kind of worry about. Um, there's other managers that think that everything kind of goes dormant. There are biennial plants um, that I worry about. There are also um, kind of your early season forbs also bloom in the fall. Um, and you'll kind of see them be somewhat green through the winter months if you don't burn them off. Um, so I worry about applying uh, just Roundup glyphosate in the fall for fescue on our good quality remnants on a planting, I don't worry about it as much because you don't have the prairie violets uh, or some of those other things that, that are blooming in the fall and carry over through the winter months. So um, I would say in a planting, if you've got fescue, I would be fine using uh, glyphosate. If it's a remnant prairie, I would probably use the select uh, or volunteers, another trade name of that clethodim based chemical. Um, and it works just as well as Roundup and then it only kills the grasses. So uh, you, just completely eliminate that worry about killing those forbs. Okay, thank you. Um, question from Sherry, and plant, we planted a broadcast seed in a small 50 by 50 foot area at the end of our yard last winter. Do the seedlings need any watering this summer? It, you're probably gonna be watering the ragweed and the foxtail, honestly. Um, those plants are going to benefit more from the watering than the ones you you're wanting to water. It wouldn't hurt it, especially if you're mowing it, uh, kind of keeping the weeds down. Um, but you know, myself and others, we do 50, 60, 70, 80 acre plantings and those don't get any water, uh, over the year that everything else doesn't get. So I, I wouldn't necessarily worry about it if you wanted to just make sure you're keeping the weed competition down on those. Okay, great. Val is asking about best herbicide for cut stump for woodies and the most effective timing. Um, Val, that information is in that chart of, of treating invasives that I shared in the chat. And so um, I would think that'll be your best bet to refer to that because then it'll, it'll, you'll have it right there. Um, there. Uh, and let's see, I might have a couple more questions. Are you, are you good for a couple more questions, Jared? Yep. Um, Max says, are the invasives you've mentioned also likely in a suburban lawn? We plan to convert our backyard, which is largely fescue, crabgrass, clover, and other lawn weeds. Do we need to wait two to three years before seeding? Also, what about planting oats or other cover crop while waiting? And there was another question about cover crops as well, do, or nurse crops. Do we use nurse crops or cover crops? So He's asking about invasives. Would they be the same in a suburban yard? Do we need to wait two to three years? And then what about cover crops? Um, so the invasives are definitely going to be different. I would think in your yard, you're going to be dealing more with clover. I would worry about uh, clover can really ruin a planting if it gets thick. Um, typically, if you spray out fescue, you're going to see clover come in that following year. Um, if it were me and I was, I was planting something in my yard, I would want to wait one growing season. So uh, say you're planting, you're wanting to plant your backyard, I would spray it this fall, spray it next spring, see what it does all next summer, and then spray it again in the fall um, or throughout the growing season. So you've got those three sprayings I talked about and then plant that uh, next winter. 
um, you really want to give a full growing season to see what pops up because if you plant that seed, you could get a carpet of Ladino clover in there that just ruins it. Um, and there's no way to kill it out without killing those forbs. Um, so, and it's highly competitive, it's drought tolerant, things like that. So um, what was the next part of the question, Carol? Uh, cover crops, do, do we ever use nurse crops or cover crops? So uh, yeah, you know, as far as like soil microbes go, things like that, soil's always better, healthier in a constant state of growing. If you've got bare ground out there, it's just cooking in the sun. Uh, there's no root material for things to feed on in the, uh, in the upper soil profile. So we do like to plant things. I mentioned the, the sunflowers. We used millet one year. Um, you could use, like in the fall, you could use turnips. Um, and turnips actually flower that following year. They're not persistent. So they, they serve a pollinator uh, benefit. You could eat the turnips if you enjoy eating turnips, things like that. But yeah, there's definitely uh, a lot of cover crops you could use to, like I said, keep that soil kind of broke up, uh, keep it in an active state. Um, and you, the one thing you want to stay away from is like some of the rye grasses. There are some pretty aggressive um, cover crop type plants that will reseed themselves and, and actually be a competitor. So you either want to kill them out or make sure you're planting one that's going to kind of go away the following spring eventually. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, uh, a couple of people asked about where do you buy the dye to mix with herbicides so that when you're spraying a plant, it helps you keep track of where you've been. So uh, we get most of our chemicals through Van de East. Um, it's, it's cheap and easy for us to order through. You have to be kind of a company. Um, most ag supply stores uh, like Orschlin's Tractor Supply, most of those types of places are going to carry an herbicide dye. Um, I like the blue. I've used red and purple before. Uh, I'm half colorblind, so some of the colors don't, don't appear as obvious to, as blue to me. Uh, the purple works well. Something that's going to turn those plants darker. Um, I think there's like even yellow dye. I don't know how you'd ever see that out there, but, um, but yeah, just something you're going to see well. Um, and typically I think they recommend one ounce per gallon of water. Uh, but yeah, they're usually pretty readily available at those uh, farm supply stores. And will they give you instructions on how much to add? Yeah, it'll be right on their label. Okay, thank you. Um, question about, maybe, uh, let's see, one more about, and then I, I'm afraid we'll, if there's other, well, no, there was a question about species for um, wet, wetter areas. Um, so a lot of these um, prairie plants grow well from a range of wet to dry. Uh, we were, I was talking with somebody else today about prairie dock. Um, I see it on glades, but I also see it in like kind of woodland fen areas. So you've got the driest of the dry and then the kind of the wettest area without being a wetland that you're going to find. So a lot of these prairie plants are like that. Um, the grasses especially, like the big blue stems, um, the bigger warm season grasses are going to do great in those wetter soils. You won't see as much like prairie drop seed. You'll see more sedges and rushes in the low areas. Uh, prairie blazing star does great in low areas. Rattlesnake master seems to do fine in lower areas. Um, there's a lot of really neat things depending on how wet it is like blue indigo does w uh, well in prairie swales. Um, Monarda will do well in wet areas. The uh, wing stems do good. There's a yellow wing stem that does good in prairie wet areas. Um, so there's a whole host of those. You can go on various plant dealer websites and, um, and look those up. But yeah, there's, I would say there's almost as many um, prairie plants that do well in wet areas as there is that will do well in dry areas, so. Great, thanks. And I'll also uh, post um, a link to our a Grow Native Top 10 list for rain gardens. And a lot of those are going to be wet prairie type species, and that might help as well. Um, I just see on Facebook, someone commented, Kathy commented that she got herbicide dye in a big box store. I'm, I'm guessing, you know, like a big uh, home, home improvement or uh, type of store. So maybe more air places than the, the farm supplies carry it. Um, I hope we were able to answer most questions. I think we need to... Um, Jared's had a long day surveying for, for regals, and I will try to, for the questions we weren't able to answer, get those to Jared so we can get answers back to those individual folks. But do watch for an email from Felicia tomorrow, should be tomorrow, with links to the things we've talked about. I'd just like to add, 
Um, we wish you success with your prairie plantings. They are rewarding, um, but it's also, but they are, they are work. And that's why it's so important to, to save original prairies in the first place. And so if you love prairies and you're not already a Missouri Prairie Foundation member, we uh, invite you to be one to help us continue to protect these amazing original prairies. Um, and also we're gonna have, this is the last of our Grenadine uh, webinar presentations for this month, but we are planning more webinars on, a, on our whole host of, of topics for our later on this summer. So please do watch um, our e-news. Um, and if you don't already get our e-news, Felicia will have a, a short survey you can take, uh, which will be in part of the email. And if you wanna sign up for the e-news, you can indicate that. Um, you can check our social media channels and um, our website for information on future um, webinars. And um, thank you, Jared, so much for this great presentation. And thanks everybody for your um, information uh, or questions that you had and, and your interest in prairie plantings. They're incredibly important and we wish you luck and do let us know if you've got other questions. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you.